Okay. Great. So thanks everybody for joining us today. I'm Ross Strader. I'm joined by my colleague Wendy King from Lumen Learning. We've been working on a revision to uh, our uh, economics courses, micro and macro. And we're really pleased to be joined today by Melissa Walker and Steve Greenlaw, who are a couple of uh, faculty who have been uh, working on the course uh, with us uh, this round. Uh, Steve and Melissa, do you want to just say a couple of words about yourselves? Steve, why don't you go first? Steve, you're muted, I think. I'm going to see if I can un unmute myself. Thank you. Can there we go. Me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, uh, I, my name is Steve Greenlaw. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Mary Washington in Virginia. I've been teaching principles of micro and macro for 35 years, actually more than that now. Um, so I have a lot of experience uh, with this course. Great. Thanks, Steve. And Melissa, can you okay, say something? Sure. Okay, so my name is Melissa Walker, and I've worked for the past 15 years in higher education, specifically at the community college level, though I've taught at several different colleges and university. And I have taught general business courses, but probably in the last seven years taught both uh, micro and macro pretty exclusively. I've created courses and worked on curriculum development, um, so the opportunity to work on this aspect of the project drew on all of that. And I was happy to be a part of it. Great. Thanks, Melissa. So we have a lot to show you today. Why don't we go ahead and dive in. Wendy, let me turn it over to you. I think you're going to talk through some slides first, and we'll kind of trade off to talk about different pieces of the course. Great. Thank you, Ross. So I'm Wendy King. I'm the course product manager, and I've been kind of heading up this project to revamp our economics courses, and beginning with our macro course. And I think all of you probably saw um, we're planning to release these courses um, to the broad audience, they're ready for use. Actually, macro is ready for use now. We have a new cartridge that we will be sending out to current customers um, on June 1st, and the microeconomics course is following close behind it. So while today we're gonna speak specifically to macroeconomics, these changes and improvements um, are, are valid in both courses. And so some of the general changes here, you can see on the screen, we've improved the course organization as a whole. We've really honed in um, to on those modules to make the modules of more equal size and depth and within those modules we've made significant changes and improvements to the content itself and so we've streamlined the learning outcomes and have really tried hard to to tie in those learning outcomes to the content and also to these assessments so that students um, can see how they're doing check their learning and then um, get assessed on that and then get, of course, feedback on, on where they're at. And then they know where to, to improve and do further work. And so we've also included new watch it videos. And so lots of lots of videos um, from a few different sources. We've got some interactive graphs that students can step through, especially some of those complex, tricky graphs that have multiple lines and multiple pieces. Those have been broken down. Um, so we've got, this is a big improvement and big change, um, practice questions that are um, embedded within the text. And so students can read a paragraph or so and get that practice right away. And then at the end of a section of learning, we've got the learn by doing, which is like a, yet another kind of self-check quiz. And then we still have quizzes at, at the modular level on top of that. Um, each module also includes dis discussions and assignments, as well as the quantitative based problem set type um, assignments. And uh, they all come with quiz banks. And so just to show you what this looks like, I'm going to jump into an LMS here. And this is inside of a Canvas course. Of course, this also works with other LMSs like Blackboard. Um, and really every LMS you can imagine, but you can see this here in Canvas, what it looks like um, in our Waymaker format. And so you've probably uh, seen the course itself. Um, we'll just take a look here in the, in the Waymaker form, format. And so each of the modules is grouped like this. Uh, we'll just dive into supply and demand. Uh, the study plan is where you're gonna find most of the course content. So if I click on, onto this, the study plan will take me 
to the why it matters, which is at the very beginning of the course. And this just gives us a sneak peek of what we're going to be learning and why that matters. And so what's the importance of supply and demand? And so this gives us the example of a coffee shortage and how that's affected the price of coffee. And so once I kind of have an idea of what this module is about, there is a show what you know pretest. Um, and in the past, these, these were pretty bare bones. We didn't have as many questions here. But now, since we've uh, greatly enhanced the number of questions in our test banks, we're able to pull, pull from a much larger pool here. And so students can kind of see, I'm just going to click through some of these and guess, but um, as they click through, uh, they can get a feel for what content will be covered within the module. And then also, um, once they're done with it, um, they will get feedback and kind of what areas they did not perform so well, and then what areas um, they actually already did quite well on so they can know where they really should spend their time focusing as they go through the course content in the module. So again, I'm just going to click through. So you can see there's lots of graphs and charts and tables and um, applied examples. And then as we submit that, um, so this tells me, so, oh, I already know, I actually know a little bit about economic systems apparently, but I need to spend really my time focusing on that. And then when we return to the study plan, the study plan will actually update. Let's see, this is a demo course, so it might not have updated. I can give you a sneak peek, let's see, I might not be having those updates right now, but that will actually update to show me what um, areas I really need to hone in on. And so if we take a look here at this equilibrium section, so each of these content sections take us to the content pages of the course. And so this is what you would think of as like the textbook itself. And so we've got an introduction page and then uh, this here at the top can tell us where we are in the course. And then you can see these are some of the practice questions that are embedded within the text to check how we're doing. And then an embedded video and a glossary found at the bottom of the page. And then when we get to the end of a section of um, one of these tiles within the, uh, within the course content, we have this self-check. And so this, again, we can kind of gauge how we did just a guess, and then it can tell me, oh, this is where I need work, this is where I should focus, and I can either retake that or return to the study plan. And again, you can see that updated to tell me that I do need work and I need to focus on that and probably go back and retake it and reread some of those pages. And so, um, yeah, we'll, we'll show you, we'll kind of take turns in this presentation, um, sharing some of the, the three key changes that we've made to the content. The first, or, or the course, as a whole. Uh, part one, we'll talk a little bit about how we've improved the content. And Steve Greenlaw has been our chief uh, contributor there. He is our subject matter expert, and he's been able to go through the course and hone in on areas that needed additional work. And so we'll let Steve begin by talking about ways that he's seen improvements in the content. And Steve has also been using Waymaker for several years now. And as a a real life instructor, he can tell us about some of the strengths that he sees um, in using Waymaker and also in the updates to the course. So Steve? Yeah, can you go back to the, the next slide, please? Of course. Let's see. Improving content. Here you go. Right. Right here? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay. Um, if you're not familiar with the content of Waymaker principles, it's pretty standard. Um, Lumen Learning brought together several dozen principles of economics instructors from a variety of schools, uh, community colleges, four-year schools, and then asked them, what are the learning outcomes you teach in your principles courses? Um, what came out of that was basically the outline for this book, this text. Um, and you can see the results of that on the slide in terms of the modules. If you think of modules as chapters in a book, in a print book, um, that's what you're seeing here. Um, <clears throat> the way Waymaker is structured is very modularized. Um, there are modules, there are sections in modules, there are pages and sections, and each one goes down to a kind of a lower level. 
So when we thought about reorganizing um, Waymaker, um, there were two goals in mind. First, we asked ourselves the question, what's the best sequencing of the material? Um, and then second, can we make the material more modularized so that instructors can more easily choose to, to use or omit different parts of the course? Um, and and we, we made a lot of progress in that area. Um, let me just give you some examples of what we did. Um, module four is on applications of supply and demand. What that, that's a new module that combined elements from other previous modules on government intervention and markets and consumer producer and total economic surplus. So, so some beginning welfare kinds of ideas. Uh, we decided to put them all together right after supply and demand, and I think that's going to work a lot better for our students. Um, modules six and seven, macro measures. Um, th that is, those are two modules that look at um, measurement in economics, kind of the national income and product accounts and, and that sort of thing. So what we did here is we came up with a better sequence of the major sections over these two modules. So it just seemed to play out better. Um, the next thing we did is we moved the income expenditure model, the old Keynesian cross model, from an appendix to its own module. And in the process, we revised the Keynesian part of module nine so that that would stand alone from the income expenditure model and the income expenditure model would stand alone from that. So you can teach either or both um, and, and you won't lose anything in the process, okay? Um, we split um, the monetary material into two modules. Um, uh, money and banking was the one and uh, monetary policy was the other. Again, I'm not claiming that this is uh, rocket science, we're just making it read better, I think. Um, and then finally, the, la the module 14 on policy application is where all the really advanced material on fiscal and monetary policy and real world kinds of applications goes. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a module that really um, pulls everything together um, from the whole macro part of the course. Um, so the other thing that we did, and, and this is important, is, is we rewrote the entire text. Every semester um, since, for the last three years, when we get feedback, when we've used, used Waymaker and we've gotten feedback from it, we have made uh, revisions and corrections in areas that we thought needed that. But over the last year, um, I reread and revised every page in the entire uh, Waymaker macro book, if you, want to, if you want to think of it as a book, okay? Um, so I think it's gonna read a lot better, um, and, and I think it's clearer for the students, and that's kind of the important thing. Okay, um, Wendy, could you go on to the next slide, please? Yes, I'm there on learning outcomes. Yes, okay. okay. Um, so the first thing that we did is in the earlier version, we had learning outcomes down two levels, kind of the broad learning outcomes and then the secondary outcomes. We now have it down to level three. Uh, Ross, what's the name of the, that third level? I never remember that, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, they're really page level outcomes. Is okay, yes, right, okay, fine. Um, so um, in, this, in this process, we did a better job of syncing content with learning outcomes. So everything lines up carefully. Um, and in the process, we've got learning outcomes now listed on every page in Waymaker. So the student immediately knows when they open a page what it is they're gonna get from that page. Um, I think that's gonna help a lot. Um, next slide, Wendy. I'm there on the videos. Okay. Um, so, what we've done is we've embedded videos um, in the pages as opposed to having them kind of separate as extra material. Um, we also really beefed up um, the, the quantity as well as the quantity, uh, the quantity as well as the quality of the videos, okay? Um, the majority of the videos now 
are videos designed for teaching and learning. Um, previously, a lot of them were from sort of newscasts, and so they didn't necessarily always line up with what we were trying to teach. Um, so this is a big improvement. The other thing is um, the videos that we have now uh, are very high production value, uh, much better than I could make on my own. Um, and the students really like that. Um, they, think it, they think it makes the book fun, uh, you know, and I, um, so that's a good thing. Um, I, I just wanted to end by saying a little something about teaching with Waymaker. Um, uh, and I'm anxious to hear what um, I, I, one of our audience um, apparently uses Waymaker. Is that true? I well, think so. Yes. I don't know if we can get feedback quickly enough. No, that's, but... fine. that's fine. Um, uh, so I've been teaching with Waymaker for three years. Um, I've used it in both online courses and face-to-face -face courses. Um, and one of the lessons, one of the themes of Waymaker is helping students study smarter. It's, it's, it's uh, teaching students metacognition. Okay, to do that, Waymaker offers a variety of regular quizzes, and Wendy talked about these. At the beginning of every module is a pretest that tells students what they already know. At the end of each section is a short quiz. At the end of each module is a longer quiz. The whole point is to give students regular feedback about how they're learning. Uh, additionally, the instructor gets feedback too, and that's really, really important. And the reason why is because it allows me to make better, more efficient use of my instructional time. In any given week, Waymaker allows me to know um, stuff that I never knew before, which is which students are struggling so that I can reach out only to those students who need my help. And also Waymaker allows me to know what topics the whole class is struggling with so that I can spend our scarce class time on the material st students need help with and I don't spend a lot of time on the stuff they already know. As economists, I think you can appreciate uh, the benefits of this. Um, you know, in short, Waymaker gives me a much better feel for the effectiveness of my teaching and the effectiveness of student learning before it comes to the exams. And that's really, really important, I think. All right, um, I think I'll end there. Great, thank you so much, Steve. That is so valuable to hear it from your perspective. And I, I must add that Steve has done, he's literally, read over and revised and edited and gone back and forth with me on every single page of this text. And I, I think we're just so pleased with, with the results. And I think that definitely carries through in the text and you see that, um, that, that consistency throughout the course now that I think was lacking in some areas. And so it really carries through very nicely. So thank you, Steve. And next, um, we're going to hear Ross is going to tell us a little bit more about the interactives and the increased interactivity and graphs and uh, as well as some of the assessment changes that we've made in this edition of the course. Thanks, Wendy. So uh, since you have the slide deck open, I have a few slides. Maybe you could keep that up and walk through and then I actually want to uh, dig into the course uh, as well so we can trade off in a minute. Okay. Uh, so we have, actually go to the next slide, Wendy. Let me uh, say a little bit about interactivity. Uh oh, um, I made some changes that I think aren't in yours. So actually, let's trade okay. now. If you want to okay. go. Okay, good idea. <laughs> All right, so let me share my screen. Okay, are you seeing my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, Lumen started out uh, in, in the business of OER, Open Educational Resources, and we're still very much in that business. But uh, historically, a lot of OER has been you know, uh, open textbooks uh, as opposed to open courses. And, and what I mean by that is there's a lot that we can do with today's tools and technologies in the way of interactivity. And it turns out that this is really beneficial in terms of learning. Um, some of you may have heard of the Open Learning Initiative at Carnegie Mellon. I spent much of my career there before coming to Lumen, and we had the chance to work with some learning scientists and cognitive psychologists at uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, to, to really try and figure out, you know, what, what is available now with these new tools and technologies that can help with learning that we, you know, haven't had or have had, excuse me, have had in limited ways in the classroom before. 
And one of the main things they said was that the more that you can get students interacting with the content, uh, then the better they learn. Uh, and in fact, there was a recent study done by uh, some folks at Carnegie Mellon over a, a number of OLI courses, and I think over 12,000 students. And this is the, the paper that was published. I'll just shortcut to the end here, which is the, the highlighted that red box there. What they found is that the learning effect of doing is about six times greater than that of reading. So the, the text is critically important. Uh, you know, it gets students focused on the material, but until we have them actually practice that material, that's when it really starts to, to stick in your brain. And this can be, you know, interactivity in terms of, you know, super fancy simulations that take a lot of uh, time and resources to build. It can also be just a simple multiple choice question in the middle of a page that has the student reflect or put a stake in the ground about what they're learning. So going back to this slide that Wendy showed a minute ago, we try to incorporate this uh, as much as possible into the new econ courses. And we have this in a number of ways now. Uh, we have some interactive graphs that I'll show. Um, we have some, uh, some simulations that have students going in and, and deciding what they do in different scenarios. Uh, and then we also have uh, a number of interactive questions in the, in the content, uh, some of which are able to be regenerated so that students can get essentially an infinite amount of practice uh, on the question until they feel comfortable with that concept. So let me switch over. I think I have to stop sharing here and then go over to the course itself. And I want to show you some examples of these. Okay, and can somebody just confirm that you can see the course now? Yep, looks good. Okay, great. Uh, so this is a page on price ceilings. And uh, as I scroll down here, you can see that we have a, a video talking about uh, Nixon and the price controls in the 70s. And then we dig more into price ceilings. And then we come to this interactive graph. And I'll show you the, the way this started out. This is a graph that originated in OpenStax. Here's the OpenStax page. And there's a graph in the middle of the page. Now, I'm not an economist. I'm an engineer by training, so I'm pretty comfortable with graphs, but I'm, I'm a novice in terms of uh, economics, and, and that seems a little bit overwhelming to me. I'm not sure quite how to read that or where to start. And for students, you know, uh, many of whom aren't as comfortable with uh, quantitative uh, types of materials and, and graphs, uh, that can be a little bit overwhelming. And so what we've done in the Waymaker course is to simplify this graph just to the original supply and demand curves and the original equilibrium point. And then you'll see the text over here on the right talks about what that is. In this case, the context is rent control and what happens when a city uh, starts becoming popular, how rent rises and what, uh, what kind of impact price ceilings might have. So it says you can see the original equilibrium point, $500 and 15,000 units. And then it asks the students a question. What do you think is going to happen? What's going to be the effect of greater income or an increase in popularity? And let's see if I get this wrong and I think this is wrong, <laughs> uh, then I get feedback. And this is, again, going back to my time at OLI at Carnegie Mellon, uh, this is one of the really powerful things that we found about the, you know, the online tools that we have today, is to be able to give targeted feedback to students when they make a mistake that corrects that mistake right when it happens is a really big advantage here, as opposed to when the, you, know, you turn into homework and I think all of us have, uh, have taught here before, and we know that, you know, even if we take the time to write lots of good feedback, you know, by the time the students get the paper back, even if they take the time to read that good feedback, their brain's just in a different place than it was when they made that mistake. So that immediate targeted feedback is key here. So I got that wrong, but it gives me some feedback on why, and it says, okay, in this case, actually the demand curve would shift to the right. And so I click that and, and that's correct. Now I go on to the next slide. And we've added in what that new demand curve looks like. And there's some text that explains it over here. Okay, it says, let's go to the next slide and see what happens when we add a price ceiling. We've done that with this $500 line there. And then again, we stop and we ask the student the question, what's going to be the new quantity demanded? Uh, and the new quantity demanded, let's see, I think that uh, the common mistake here is that a lot of students would choose this point at 19,000. Oh, sorry. Uh, I got that backwards. The mistake is to pick the new equilibrium point. And so if you do that, then you get feedback about uh, why that's not right, and that actually the new, um, new quantity demanded is the one that I chose there at 19. Now, you might be surprised to say we also have targeted feedback for that correct answer. Uh, and the reason is, uh, actually, the, the, the mistake I made illustrates that. I, I might have guessed on this, or maybe, you know, maybe I'm, uh, I'm trying to choose between two options and I'm not completely 100% uh, confident in my choice. So having that targeted feedback for correct answers as well 
um, helps to reinforce that answer. And for students that aren't completely sure, uh, you know, help, helps to explain why that answer is the correct answer. When we looked at uh, data before on some of these, we've actually found students will go back and even after getting an answer or question correct, they'll click on the incorrect uh, answer options just to read that feedback. Uh, so it's, it's a really great learning opportunity. And finally, when I go on to the last slide, now we finally have the completed graph here. We sort of built it up from what the student already knew uh, slowly uh, with interaction from them along the way to show these, the, 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 the different curves that appear and to highlight the point of this graph, which is the uh, excess demand there caused by the price ceiling. So we have a number of these throughout the course. Uh, this is a really great tool, by the way. This is um, uh, fueled by a tool called H5P that if you're not familiar with, uh, you should check out. They're making it really easy to put these kinds of interactives into our courses, whereas 10 years ago, this would have been uh, done by Flash. Uh, now we, we, we can offer them much more easily than we could before. So I encourage you to check that out. As I'm going to scroll down here. And Melissa is actually going to talk about some of the practice questions that we have here with feedback. So I will skip over that for now. But I wanted to show you uh, there are some quantitative type questions, or actually this one's not quantitative, but many of them are. I'll show an example of both. Uh, these are the ones I mentioned before where the student's able to try multiple versions. So you see where it says try another version of this question. This one is about price ceilings and price floors, and specifically about binding price ceilings and price floors. And I, I mentioned to you, I'm not an economist, but I think I've actually learned enough by working on this course that uh, my understanding is that, let's see, a, a binding price ceiling would be one that's below the equilibrium point. And so if I remember that correctly, uh, this price ceiling is going to be non-binding. And so I click that and submit. Ah, great, I got it right. But since I'm not quite sure, I just learned this pretty recently, let me take another stab at that. So I'm gonna click this link up here. This is try another version. If you look at the graph right now, pay attention to how this changes. As it regenerates, okay, now I have another one. Now this is the same scenario. That's also non-binding. Let me just go through and I'll get a different one. Okay, here's a price floor. And I think that's gonna be non-binding as well. Let's see if I'm right. I am, I, I learned something. Um, and if I keep regenerating, ah, okay, now I think this is a binding price ceiling. Yeah, so it, it's really nice to be able to just hit this a few times and generate enough different scenarios that, you know, I, I think I remember what that is, but I'm not quite sure. Let me try two or three of these and make sure before I move on. Um, so from a learning standpoint, I'm, I'm really excited about the power behind, uh, behind this tool. And then if I go to the next page, we have a little bit longer uh, learn by doing activity that gives them a scenario. This is driven by that same technology that lets you regenerate uh, uh, the problem and, and get another question. And this one has them actually go in and start putting in values from the graph. So the quantity at equilibrium is three. <coughs> okay, I got that right. Then ask me what the price is. And then it uh, goes on, uh, you know, what happens if there's a price floor? How does that affect things? And I have a whole page here but again, if I work through that and maybe I'm not quite confident enough, maybe I want more practice, I can click this link to generate another version. Okay, and now my quantity is going to be at four instead of three and the graph has changed and I, I, can, I can answer more questions about that. And again, you know, with the ability to, to generate new random versions, the student essentially has infinite practice here for all uh, practical purposes um, to be able to practice this until they really get this concept. So super excited about that. The last thing I wanted to show is uh, more interactivity. This is a simulation that I mentioned to you. Uh, this one uh, is in our uh, let's see, module on supply. And what this does, let me hit continue here. It gives you some introductory stuff. Uh, you're part of a club that's putting on a soccer match. You're in charge of food. And you're going to be um, getting food trucks you know, to show up to the event. And so again, I click through the introductory screens, which I'll do quickly now because of time. But then I get into making some choices. So I have a food truck that can't handle more than 30 guests. You know, what do I need to do? Do I hire a second truck? Uh, you know, what, what choices can I make here to, to, uh, to solve the problem here? And again, it, it, there's a whole network of pathways behind here. So as I walk through here and choose different options, I get feedback on how well that worked and what some of the constraints are. And so we have a number of these uh, through the courses as well to let the student play with these scenarios with sort of real, real world problems and numbers and, uh, and then find out what happens when they make these different choices. Again, great way to learn. 
got the interactivity in uh, that shows that students uh, will retain this much better when they actually are practicing with these concepts. So I think that's all I was going to show. Let me stop sharing. And I think, Wendy, do you want to take over again? And then Melissa is going to talk for a minute. Of course. Um, do you see my screen again? I do. Awesome. OK. Um, so next, we're going to talk, uh, speak a little bit more to these assessments. Um, and Melissa is one of our SPEs who helped author uh, these practice questions, as well as some of the summative and formative questions included in the course. And so I was going to let uh, Melissa speak to her experiences with the embedded practice questions specifically um, in the process of creating those and um, uh, how she came about doing that and the value that that adds to the course. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Wendy. So I had the opportunity to help author um, these assessment questions for this course for the macroeconomics. And um, from what I understand, adding the embedded questions to the course was relatively new. And it really was the text material and learning outcomes where, where the clear starting point was. The idea was to read over uh, this material and make sure these two pieces really align before creating the embedded practice questions. So these practice questions are distinctly different from the MGAs. And I forget what MGA stands for, having worked on it for a while. <laughs> these are the machine graded assessments. And yes. So those are just the questions that are found in the self checks at the end of each um, grouping of content, um, as well as the questions that are found in like the, the, the show what you know at the beginning of the module, as well as the, the quiz, the final quiz for the module. So those are the distinct, sometimes we refer to those j combined as MGAs because they're machine graded, you don't have to worry about them. These are also machine graded, um, but these are just the embedded practice questions. Right. And the reason why I wanted to bring those, thank you, Wendy. The reason why I wanted to bring that up was these are typically multiple choice questions, which have a place in this course, uh, but they are distinctly different from those because the goal is to really learn by doing, to apply the concepts, not just regurgitate the text, but many times um, have it be conceptual in nature. So really stretch the students thinking behind it. My idea was to create these questions um, to make them have to dig and formulate to find the correct answer. And when I, um, when I needed to make sure these questions aligned with the text, um, which then aligned with the learning outcomes. So there was this nice kind of backwards design progression that was happening because um, it was almost like a um, scaffolding that was happening. So this can sometimes be harder than it seems when trying to transfer the knowledge to the actual application. So there had to be a real concerted effort there. Um, the value I saw in these practice questions was really fourfold. So number one, uh, these were embedded in the actual pages through what I know as call out boxes. And that makes them real distinct um, you know exactly what you're looking at, and it's real transparent to the student, meaning they know where to look for the answers, and it wasn't necessar necessarily spelled out for them verbatim, but they knew where to look for it. And again, they might have to sit there and read and look around and formulate their answer because these were conceptual, where they really had to think about um, the answer, and sometimes the question required um, longer um, answers and um, they had to really look at um, the reading and sometimes even look at the graphs as well to find that answer um, and also listen to the videos. So number two, when writing them, common mistakes were captured as well as options for the answers. And this wasn't necessarily to trick the students, but to really make sure they were getting it um, and reading as much as possible and um, conceptualizing it in their, in their minds. And sometimes the answers were actually in the feedback. Um, I know that Ross talked about how sometimes students will click on the wrong answers to get the explanations that are written in. Um, and there's learning done that way as well. So number three, the, um, that brings me to the room the robust feedback. Each of the three answers would, when possible, have kind of these unique explanations about why one answer was correct while the other two were incorrect. 
and sometimes how not to do something is just as valuable uh, in the learning process as how to do something. So, um, and on this next slide right here on the try it, that's number four. So lastly, many of these questions have multiple attempts available, and this really helps um, students enable them to really fine tune his or her learning of a particular concept. Um, it can also build confidence for the quiz or exam um, that are later given. And homework and exercises, uh, in my experience, um, that is the place where students should feel safe to learn a particular concept or really um, fine tune um, learning on a particular exercise or question whether it takes them one try or a thousand tries. Um, so those are kind of the key aspects of uh, the embedded practice questions that I learned along the way. Um, one of, I've also taught in Waymaker and kind of to piggyback off of um, Steve, what I really like about the text and um, the, the way it's laid out as far as the whole course is that it, really focuses on those main macroeconomic principles that were pulled from the field. So we know they're important and um, valid, um, but it focuses almost exclusively on them so that students don't get lost in the details and in, in kind of this extraneous, um, almost extraneous um, extra stuff. And that helps them kind of walk away from this course um, knowing it and remembering it. Um, I can't tell you how many times students have said, yeah, I took a course for a whole semester. I have no idea what I learned. So um, that to me is concerning. And um, the whole layout and framework of Waymaker helps alleviate some of that. So. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, it's so the work you did was, it was so invaluable on these practice questions and I think I, I'm just so impressed with all of our SPEs who worked with us in, in kind of predicting and anticipating where students do make those common mistakes. And so you can see in this example here with the feedback, um, when students click the wrong one, the feedback is like, oh, did that just read my mind? How did it know? That's, what, that's exactly what I was thinking. And I think um, me also being a non-economist, I've, I've learned so much uh, in working through this course and also through the videos, I, I can't emphasize those enough that I think they, they've made a huge impact. Um, and we do encourage students to watch those in the course, and that's something, of course, instructors can, can choose to, to highlight to students and say, hey, this is, these videos really help. I think, especially on, on struggling uh, on concepts, those trickier concepts where, okay, I've read through it, but do I really get it? And then you can go watch the video and then you get to do the, the practice and then practice again and again and again until you can really, and students with the learning outcomes in place in the course, they can really see, they can really check their own understanding and say, did I get this? Do I feel prepared to go on and take the final quiz? And so Waymaker, in fact, I'll pop out and pop into the course one more time. Um, you can see in Waymaker, so the students work in the study plan, uh, just pop, pop into a different module. Uh, so this is one of the macroeconomic measures modules. So they're in the study plan and after we've gone through the entire course and we've done uh, the text and we've read these pages and we've taken the self checks and uh, these numbers will change and uh, we can get, we can see it, it will show up here green showing that we did understand that we did well on that self check. And then uh, there's a putting it together page at the end of the module that just kind of recaps the things that we've learned. So this is what we learned about inflation and unemployment. Here's another application of that. And then we can say, you know what, I think I'm ready for the quiz finally. And I would go back out here um, and this would actually pop us out in, um, back into the, the LMS. And so in this instance, we're coming back here into Canvas and I would actually go to the the quiz, sorry, my computer is getting a little bit overloaded here, but I don't know where it's taking me. Um, it would take me to, to, the, to the module quiz. And I just love that students really get that autonomy to check their own understanding and to feel fully prepared and ready for those quizzes. So um, just quickly, we're going to cover a few of the other types of um, assessments that are included in the course. I know Ross already mentioned several of these. Um, so we have these qualitative questions also embedded in the course. Um, some when they're uh, more, 
numerous. Uh, we typically keep them on separate pages for this learn by doing page. And so again, that's just more applied practice. Um, and this is the self check. And then um, this slide here is just emphasizing some of the data driven improvement that we took um, in making these changes to the course. We actually did run some numbers and we looked at quizzes and we looked at scores of these formative and sub summative questions um, in past iterations of the course and we we found and discovered that these are areas where students are struggling and so for example the production possi possibilities frontier uh, students were just not getting it and so when Stephen and I and uh, other SMEs looked through the course we thought what can we do to improve this area and so we went we found a good video we we edited the text, we, we gave more exam, we provided more examples, and again, we added in those practice. And so in all of these areas, we really were able to see this is where we, it was deficient in certain areas, and we were able to, to focus on those areas. Ross, do you have anything more to add to the data-driven improvement here? Um, no, I think that was a, a good summary. It's, it's really nice to be able to, you know, when we put a course out, our course is kind of a hypothesis as to this is the best job we think we can do to help students master these objectives. But that hypothesis uh, is, is worth testing. And so by collecting data and looking at where students struggled, that really allows us to focus uh, our time on, on the improvement work to come back and say, okay, students are really struggling here. Uh, do we need to add more content? Do we need to add more practice? You know, are there uh, questions that are tricky in ways that were un unintended? So it really helps us to, uh, to be able to focus that work and, and hit the course uh, for improvements where it really matters to students. Great, thank you. Um, and again, this just emphasizes this, what Melissa mentioned earlier as MGAs. So these are our self checks in our quizzes. Um, and so we made different passes. We had three separate faculty looking through the course to see, does this align? Does this work? Is this honing in on what we want it to? Um, and we've really uh, beefed up these quiz banks. And so this shows us, uh, we actually have more current numbers now to show you in the full macro course. And I, I believe Ross has those new numbers for uh, yeah. things we've added to the course. Yeah, this was uh, this slide was for a demo module that we put out several months ago. But uh, now that we're wrapping up, we have more accurate counts for the the whole whole ball of wax. And between the two courses, micro and macro, uh, there are five modules that are are shared, and then uh, each each course has a, a number of its own modules. Uh, if you take both courses together, uh, we've done a lot of work to augment the quiz pool that feeds the cell checks and the quizzes. Uh, and we have, between the two courses, we have about 350 of those page level outcomes that we've been talking about uh, that you see at the top of the pages. And we try and have about eight uh, questions for each of those outcomes so that uh, students can take the quiz multiple times. You know, students aren't all seeing the same questions. Uh, there's some randomization there as they're pulled from the pool. And that pool is up to uh, almost 3,000 questions now between the two courses. Um, so that's great. And then the embedded practice that Melissa showed off and that, that I showed off, uh, we have a little over a thousand questions there. Um, so almost 4,000 questions total between the, the two courses. Um, there's about 700 of the type that Melissa showed and then another 400 of the ones that I showed that you can regenerate and, and get more practice at. So um, yeah, big, uh, big improvement from the uh, last version of the course and, and we're super excited about it. Great. Thank you, Ross. Um, finally, we just want to conclude by sharing some of the other faculty resources that are available with the course. And so each module we mentioned includes assignments as well as problem sets. This just gives you a, a preview of what you'd find, and I'll show you in the course as well. There's a faculty resources section where you can find links to the actual assignment. These do come automatically uh, uploaded into the LMS. They can easily be removed, deleted, ignored. Um, edited or um, yeah if faculty have their own assignments in mind they can just create their own very simply um, all the assignments do come with rubric rubrics as well as solutions um, and the discussion prompts uh, are also available for each module so this gives an example um, of kind of applied let's take a look at what happened to price controls after storm and so I believe this is from the module on applications of supply and demand um, and so we can see what happens 
without electricity, let's see, power generator. So what would happen to the equilibrium price here? And so this is, gives you an example of the solution to that. Um, again, there's even a graph provided. You can compare that with what students submit. Um, maybe a TA could work on this. Uh, it's just however faculty see that uh, used to their best advantage. Um, then let's see, this gives an example of a discussion. And so you can find a current news article uh, that uh, describes government intervention and see how that affects prices. Um, and also in each module, we have problem sets. And so these are gonna be the more quantitative uh, type questions, usually between, let's see, probably as few as eight to up to 20 questions um, of the more math-based type work. And so again, some modules uh, lend themselves to, to more quantitative questions and uh, a qualitative, blah, 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 quantitative questions, while others do not. Um, and so let me show you that really quickly in the course. And that is the last thing. So you can start thinking of any questions that you can have and we can discuss this as well. But just back in the course, I wanted to show you here in the, in the faculty resources. Um, if we click on assignments, for example, the course also comes with PowerPoints, uh, which are basically great starting jump, jumping points uh, for faculty who, who want to take those. We've pulled out kind of the key vocabulary and terms and topics from the course um, with a few examples as well. Um, and so those can be customized, downloaded, changed, uh, but those are available for each module as well. And this gives you an example of what these assignments would look like as well as the assignment solutions. Um, one neat new project that I do like is this, um, let's see, is it, uh, there's one that can sharing the Fed. Yes, I think this is a fun new assignment where uh, students actually use Again, I apologize, this is going so slow, there we go. Um, they use this website, the Chair of the Fed game, and they get to, to play that and actually try to make changes to the federal funds rate and see how they do controlling the, the economy. And again, this comes with an, an answer key that is invisible to students, and so for faculty only. And uh, yeah, but you get the idea. Also in these faculty resources, we include a pacing guide Steve mentioned this earlier that the modules, some faculty choose not to teach certain modules. I know some choose not to cover elasticity in the macro course or choose not to cover the income expenditure model. And those can easily be excluded. And this gives a few examples of ways to cover the course. So these are sometimes kind of excluded. Uh, modules could also be combined within weekly time periods. So module one is pretty basic as that's just this kind of a review, a review of some math concepts and a few other things. So that could be easily combined with module two and that could be just week one. Um, so you see it's, it's rather flexible in that way. And so there's all sorts of information specific for faculty there. And the course, when it does get embedded in the shell, will also come with a, um, a succeeding with Waymaker section so students can know how to really use this course to their best advantage as well. So that really is it from us. Um, the next steps to take from this point are just to stay in touch with us if you have any questions. Um, if you are already um, a, a Waymaker user with us, we will be sending out new course cartridges for the micro course um, in early June. And then, uh, for, sorry, did I say micro? For the macro course in early June and then micro is coming uh, on July 1st as well. Um, you can visit this course update page, which I think many of you have already seen, um, and you can get more information there. And you can take a look in uh, the, the course, not inside of the LMS, it looks like this, um, inside of the Lumen platform, but there you can at least review all of the content and see what it would look like. So I believe that's it. Do we have anything else to add, Ross or others? I'm not looking at the chat so do we have any questions that we can answer thomas Dorina, that was a, a lot of information thrown at you very quickly i think mostly because all four of us have uh, spent so much time working on this course and we're super excited about all the improvements so uh, apologies for the the fast-paced uh 
overview. Um, but yeah, we're, we have a few minutes left and uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Let's see, Thomas says, uh, wondering if students show any resistance to being asked to be such active learners. Uh, great question. Uh, so uh, we, we thought about that a lot at OLI when we were introducing some of these. And um, in fact, we did have cases where I remember one uh, faculty we were working with at uh, a community college um, said that she got feedback from a student, you know, who was supposed to be working through the, the course. In this case, the course was assigned as sort of a textbook replacement. So the students were working through the content, the readings, the videos, and the um, interactives outside of class. Uh, and then coming to class for the, the lecture. And, and, uh, and the student uh, to, went to talk to the teacher and said, no, you know, this isn't the deal. You stand at the board and you write, I sit in my seat and I copy it down. <laughs> and uh, so it is a bit of a new paradigm, um, but the students that, you know, one of the nice pieces of feedback we've had about Waymaker is that uh, I think when students dig into it, they find that um, because there's interactives and because they're getting feedback from Waymaker on their level of mastery, they can really work through it more efficiently. You know, they're not having to do 10 questions on a section that they already understand. Uh, so a lot of those interactives in the content are, are intended to be used to, you know, if, if they're struggling with it, then there's enough practice there for them to master it. If maybe they've had, you know, a course like this before, or they have picked some of this up on the job and, and they're able to kind of do a couple of these and, and feel comfortable that they've mastered the concept, uh, then they don't need to do, do them all. Um, they can take the self-check and, you know, make sure they're ready for the quiz. Uh, and, and then, you know, if they're not, it'll also point them to places where they need more practice. So I think ideally with courses like this, eventually we end up with enough layers of content that it lets the most novice student who needs the most help have all that practice but for other students, we can guide them, and as Steve alluded to, we can help them develop metacognitive skills to be able to choose where they need that practice in order to, to best spend their time most efficiently. And so I think that the students that, uh, once they discover that, then the feedback's been very positive. Ross, I can yes. speak to that question also. Right. Um, the first year that I taught with Waymaker, um, the vast majority of my students liked it. And, uh, but about 5% of them gave me uh, some negative comments along the lines of this course takes too long. This book takes too long to work through. When I drilled down into the details of the comments, um, what I found is they were saying, it takes me longer to work through Waymaker modules including all the assessments, then it used to take me to skim the textbook. Okay, so at that point, I decided that that was a feature rather than a bug. But what I've done subsequently is I spend a lot of time, especially at the beginning of the semester, talking about how you use this to best effect. Um, and I, I simply didn't think of that the first time out of the box. But since that first year, I haven't gotten any comments from students um, saying uh, they didn't want to be active learners. They just, they just did it, basically. So, so that's my experience. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Melissa also added, uh, Melissa, you said you found that students actually enjoy finally understanding the concepts of macroeconomics. Um, you want to elaborate on that? Sure. Sorry, just unmuted myself. Um, having worked with so many different various textbooks um, in the past, you know, a lot of them are 500 pages. Sometimes they have a lab associated with them. And because of the way a typical classroom is structured, um, just that pedagogy that goes into it, a lot of times they're just learning one concept after another after another and even though they're doing it they don't always understand what they're doing and they walk away not retaining it and so um, the way this course is structured the the infrastructure the framework that's behind it it's it builds on that knowledge it shows the knowledge then it shows how it's applied and then it asks them to apply and so that scaffolding actually happens and it works. And so I've had students say, 
you know, maybe this is my second time taking this course and I took it, you know, through a different school or through a different um, technology, but because they're active, because it's hands-on, because um, there's different um, activities, they actually are getting it kind of for the first time. And that is, is a success for them. And I think they have, um, they find pleasure and welcome that. Um, they said, I finally get it. So that's been my experience with it. That's awesome, Melissa. Thank you. Let's see. Thomas says, that's good to hear. It does sound pedagogically sound. Do you see how much time they may be working on a section? Steve or Melissa, do you want to? Um, I think in principle, we could figure that out, but I don't know how to do it. Um, what I follow is um, how many students are completing the module quizzes on the weeks that they're assigned. Mm -hmm. So I have a rough sense of that, but not, I can't, uh, I can't tell myself uh, if a student is doing it quickly or taking more time. Um, I guess I could infer that by looking at the date and timestamps on the quiz scores, but uh, I just haven't thought about that really. Yeah, we don't actually report that in the Waymaker platform uh, because whenever you see numbers like that, you should be a little bit suspicious of them. It's really hard to tell. You know, we, we Obviously, we can know how long a student is on a given page before they go to the next page, but we don't know if they have spent 20 minutes really reading that page and, and you know, paying attention to it, or if they loaded the page and then they were doing Facebook for 15 minutes. And so what we do instead is we try and concentrate on outcomes and performance on outcomes. And uh, some of the, uh, the features that Wendy talked about at the beginning, uh, we have messaging that, uh, that faculty set up that uh, help, uh, help them and students get uh, information on you know, where they're doing really well and then where they're struggling also. So our focus tends to be more around mastery of outcomes as opposed to, uh, to time spent. Well, that's the, the hour. Um, are there any other questions or if not, then we will wrap it up and, and uh, we'd love to uh, get you guys into some of the next steps that Wendy talked about so you can see the, the course for yourself and, and play around and see all these improvements. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve and Melissa and Ross. And um, thank you, Tom and Darina for attending. And please let us know if you have any questions. Great. Thanks, everybody. You bet. Have a good one. Bye-bye.